If you start with the fall of 1960, there were a lot of rules that students were expected to obey and the consequences were pretty swift if you didn't. Now there was an undercurrent of change already that had started about compulsory ROTC, about whether women could go to men's apartments or not. And the university subscribed, as most universities in the North, that it didn't discriminate. So there wasn't formal segregation like there was in the South at that time. But in fact, there was what's called de facto segregation, which is segregation by practice. For example, it was extremely hard for African-American students to find a place to live on campus. Initially, the war did not have that much of an impact on campus. One of the reasons was that if you stayed in school, you had a draft exemption. And in fact, if you stayed in school for your four years of undergraduate study and then went on to law school or graduate school, you'd be 25 by the time you got out and they wouldn't draft you anyway. By 1968 or so, as the war intensified, protests got bigger, but it was maybe 50 or 100 people instead of 10 or 20. But then in the winter of 1968, President Johnson changed the deferment requirements. You could still get a deferment for four years in undergraduate, but you couldn't get the additional two, three, or four more years as a graduate student. So beginning with my class, the class of 1968, the war became much more immediate. The first protests where any students were arrested occurred in the spring of 1968. The university really cracked down. Some of those students ended up being sentenced to the workhouse. Some black students ended up getting thrown out of school. A lot of people thought the university overreacted. The university thought it did the right thing because the next year was relatively quiet. The other thing a lot of people forget is the university by then had doubled in size from the fall of 1960 to the fall of 1969, from 22,000 students to more than 40,000. The university handled the physical side of that fairly well. They found places for the students to stay and all that. They didn't handle the people side as well, and the students were kind of feeling like they were only a number. Then in the spring of 1970, a group called Afro-Am surfaces with a set of demands about how black students are treated, and they had a meeting that ended up not turning out very well. So the students then left, and on the way out, they left the doors open, and some white students came in and marched around the building and did a little bit of property damage. The university then took disciplinary action against the black students who were the leaders of the Afro-Am movement and eventually threw them out of school. A couple of weeks later, right at the beginning of spring quarter, there was an anti-war protest in the Ohio Union, and somebody gave the orders for the police to arrest the students, well after these two incidents, a group of students got together that called themselves the Ad Hoc Coalition for Student Rights. At about 3.30, a small group of students sits down in the middle of the street at Neal and 11th. And they got a call from the medical center, the university administration did, saying the students had blocked that, that road at Neal and 11th and that was the, one of the routes to the emergency room. They decided we got to clear the, the intersection and initially they tried to do it low-key with plainclothes highway patrol people who were on call. Some of the uh, protesters resisted so they called for backup from uniformed highway patrol. So about a hundred uniformed highway patrol people showed up. OSU was a great place for 20 or 30 people doing something and two or three thousand watching. Classes had changed, a bunch of medical students still in their medical garb and other students now had collected and were watching all this. And the highway patrol said, this is more than we can handle. They called Columbus police for backup. About 60 Columbus police cars come flying up the street. By now, and it's, it's not clear who did what to who, but rocks and bottles are being thrown. The Columbus police and the highway patrol decide the only way to clear the intersection is tear gas. The tear gas then floats over to the South Campus dorms, and all it succeeds in doing is emptying out those dorms and it's like sticking a stick in a hornet's nest because the people that got gassed who were in their dorms are not happy about it. So the crowd turns kind of surly. The police and the tear gas push them up towards the oval and then up across High Street and then the police are chasing them. Police came, they were hurling tear gas all the way up the street and they came to the apartment and they hurled two canisters in, into my apartment. I've talked to numerous right students who say, we were sitting in our rooming house or our fraternity house and the police fired tear gas in there and that gets them out. And so it turns into a major brouhaha into the evening hours. As a result of continued escalation, the university has requested and the governor has authorized the use of the National Guard to assist in the restoration of order. By midnight, 
the first National Guardsmen are here and they clear High Street. And then the next day, the, the National Guard is playing whack-a-mole with the students on the oval. By Friday, things start to settle down a little bit. A lot of students go home for the weekend. That's when President Nixon announces U.S. troops are going to Cambodia. At Kent State, that creates a protest and the National Guard is called in quickly there. And then at noon on Monday is when the National Guard fires into the crowd there. Things had started to settle down here, but the word comes down from Kent State. The initial press reports were that both National Guardsmen and students were killed there. So it's got the National Guardsmen spooked, it's got the students spooked, and it's very tense here for the next two days. A lot of credit goes to a group of faculty called the Green Ribbon Committee who intersperse themselves between the National Guard and the protesters to try to keep order. And they had a group of students called the Yellow Ribbon Committee of Student Government Leaders that tried to help them. And they were probably helpful in keeping Ohio State from turning into an even uglier incident than Kent State. So after two days of this, there's open hostility now between the students and the National Guard as a result of what happened at Kent State. So they, I think, rightfully closed the place down. Campus reopens in two weeks with something like 5,000 National Guard. This isn't known very much nationally, but if you look at the number of arrests, there were more than 800, the number of law enforcement officers involved, the length of the protests, the intensity, what happened here at Ohio State was probably the worst of any campus in the country. I think you can say to the protesters, you can't have justice if you don't have order. To the law and order people, you can say, you can't have order unless you have justice. And I think the university fell, and along with the police and elected officials, into the easy, well, all we need to do is crack heads and that's gonna get these people lined up. I credit the university for learning from that. They got so caught up in just talking to themselves, they lost touch with the way students had changed, and the way the campus had changed, and the way society had changed, and thought the answer to all that was just cracking heads, and that, that wasn't.